very, very great pleasure to welcome Dr. Kate Guthrie from the University of Bristol. Um, Kate is a lecturer in music and a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at Bristol. Um, and at the moment, she's researching a book that explores some of the initiatives that developed in Britain between 1920 and 1960 to promote elite musical culture to a wider audience. And this project is the current focus of her broader interest in the social, political, and cultural history of music in 20th century Britain. Um, she's published articles in the Journal of the RMA, in Musical Quarterly, Music and Letters, Cambridge Op Opera Journal, and 20th Century Music. And she's the recipient of the Royal Music Association's Jerome Roche Prize <laughs> and the Music and Letters Westrock Prize, both in 2015. So we're very, very lucky to have her here. So please uh, join me in welcoming Kate. Um, thank you very much for that kind of introduction, Vanessa. Um, it's a real pleasure to be back at the RMA Research Student Conference. I gave my first ever paper here as a terrified PhD student um, quite a number of years ago, um, and it's a real privilege to be back today giving an invited paper, which is my first keynote. Um, I also wanted to say I don't have um, a belt, so I'm not using the microphone because there's nothing to attach it to. Um, if you can't, can you hear me at the back? Um, okay, if it, for any reason you decide you can't, feel free to move forward. What do you think of when I say 1966 and music? You might think of Simon and Garfunkel's Sounds of Silence, the Beach Boys' Good Vibrations, or perhaps the Beatles' Yellow Submarines. Most of us weren't alive to experience the release of these uh, pieces of music firsthand, but we probably all know them to sing along to anyway. <coughs> One thing that 1966 almost certainly doesn't make you think of is Harrison Birtwistle's visions of Francesco Petrarca. In case you don't know, this was an avant-garde work, stage work for children, which was premiered at the York Festival that year. With hindsight, it might seem incongruous to append such a work to a list of chart-topping singles. But even at the time of its premiere, critics were uncomfortably aware of its peripheral status. As the Observer critic Peter Hayworth noted in his review, I'd like some of their contemporaries on the continent who seem to relish existence in a cultural ghetto of progressive festivals and radio stations most of the younger English composers are uneasy at the isolation of so much present-day music from the world at large. Yet, when they strive to communicate, who listens? Who listens was, of course, a rhetorical question, but answering it hammers the point home. Besides the audience at the premiere, no one has heard the work. For soon after its performance, the composer withdrew it for revisions, which he never got round to finishing. Uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, then, it's never been recorded, and even if you want to look at what does exist at the school, you'd have to go all the way to Switzerland. <coughs> but my interest in this moment is not to rehearse the old trope of avant-garde music being inaccessible. Rather, I'm interested in the dichotomy that this writer sets up between Britain's musical culture and that of the continent. He asserts that, unlike their continental counterparts, English composers were uneasy at the chasm between living composers and audiences. He suggests that what distinguished Bert Whistle's visions was that it was attempting to redress this by composing, uh, by, being, by, a, by being a piece of music for young children to perform. One of the things I want to do in this paper is to explore the particularity of this post-war moment, to ask why these issues came to a head then. Why did it matter so much whether the public could appreciate avant-garde music? How did this impact on compositional aesthetics? And how does the public's response complicate the story told by critics? But as well as being interested in what was specific to this time and place, I'm also interested in the longer history of these ideas. For behind all the avant-garde rhetoric of innovation, these 1960s figures were just the most recent in a line of composers, philanthropists, policymakers, educators, and critics 
for whom cultural access had been a central concern. <coughs> if we were to begin a list, some of the more famous British examples might include the compositions for children by Benjamin Britten and Vaughan Williams, the music education programmes that were broadcast by the likes of Walford Davis on the BBC, the efforts that were made by the Old Vic and the Sadler's Wells to stage affordable productions of opera and ballet, or John Cohen's tonic sulfur movement. These cultural pioneers were committed to an ideal famously espoused by the 19th century poet and critic Matthew Arnold, namely that high culture had a socially and morally elevating effect. From the late 19th century onwards, this belief inspired an array of initiatives to bring elite culture within the reach of the general public. Spurred on by the expansion of mass culture and constitutional reforms in the aftermath of the First World War, reformers increasingly imagined that a love of the arts was a mark of responsible citizenship. The cumulative effect of these developments was to establish the discourse of cultural accessibility as a pervasive force in Britain. It was a force that had a defining impact not only on the distribution of music, but also on its creation. One of the legacies of this commitment to cultural accessibility is that composers writing in a moderate style have tended to fare better in Britain than those composing in more advanced idioms. The result is that Britain's musical culture has often appeared more conservative than that of the continent. And this has been something of a problem for scholars. The problem stems from the fact that the history of 20th century art music has traditionally been told through the lens of modernism and by scholars who are invested in modernist ideologies and aesthetics. Accounts have thus tended to favour uh, or focus on composers writing in progressive or more advanced idioms. Meanwhile, the cultural values that underpin the modernist tradition have served as a bar for measuring even the most conservative compositions. Put simply then, scholars have often prized characteristics such as innovation and complexity over accessibility or visceral appeal. With modernism as the arbiter of value in this way, Britain's musical culture has not fared especially well. Even its most preeminent 20th century composers do not fit comfortably into the modernist mould. I'm thinking here of people like Elgar and Britton, Vaughan Williams and Maxwell Davis. This general problem that has been posed by uh, British culture, Britain's musical culture in the 20th century is particularly pronounced when it comes to music written for educational purposes. The way that scholars have dealt with this repertoire is, for the most part, typical of broader scholarly tendencies. <coughs> Some have tended to admit this music altogether from their accounts of composers' lives and works, more or less explicitly dismissing it as second rate. Others have tried to validate it by foregrounding its modernist credentials. For example, uh, they've subjected it to extensive analyses in an attempt to prove that it really was as complicated as the music that these composers wrote for professionals. The recent trend for broadening our understanding of modernism has also come in use here, as it has allowed works that were previously considered outside the narrow modernist canon to be brought within its fold. So, through a mixture of strategic omission and appeals to modernism, scholars have tried to carve out a place for British compositions within 20, traditional histories of 20th century art music. But it's my contention that they've done so on false terms. If the commitments to accessibility on the one hand and high art values on the other seem to be in opposition, it is the tension between these that I think has shaped Britain's musical culture. Reanimating this tension is therefore key to developing a more historically rooted understanding of Britain's cultural value system and of how it has impacted on the creation, dissemination and reception of music, elite and popular, from the late 19th century to the present day. Today, I want to explore this proposition by revisiting a period early in Maxwell Davis's career when this tension between cultural accessibility and uh, modernist um, aesthetics came to the fore in an unprecedented way. In January 1959, 
A young Peter Maxwell Davis was appointed director of music at Sirencester Grammar School. Whether the headmaster knew quite what he was letting himself in for is unclear. At the time, the composer had the reputation of a cultural iconoclast. He was, as one reviewer put it, a man so out of touch with ordinary performers and audiences that many doubted his competence and sincerity, which are not exactly the most promising credentials for a school teacher. What's more, his move into teaching did not reflect a desire to redress this situation. On the contrary, he was driven primarily by financial necessity, rather than by any high-minded commitment to education or cultural accessibility. His appointment was thus one of those haphazard coincidences of history that turned out to be significant, not just for Maxwell Davis's own stylistic development, but also for the musical establishment more broadly. Although he only remained in post for three years, during this time, he became a focal point for an emerging debate about teaching modern music in schools. His appointment proved to be particularly timely, for the figure of the avant-garde composer turned school teacher resonated with the broader educational and cultural upheaval that 1950s Britain was facing. In terms of educational reform, the wartime administration in Britain had initiated a huge expansion in the state provision of secondary schooling and of university places. However, where in the past schools had provided a liberal humanistic education for a minority elite, the new mass education was characterised by specialisation and more scientific modes of learning. In short, Britain was becoming a more technocratic society and this was reflected in a growing emphasis on the sciences. The merits of this new pedagogic approach were hotly contested. Its advocates argued that it would increase employability and strengthen the economy, much like the arguments made for favouring the sciences today. But detractors predicted negative consequences for the well-being of society. One such was the art critic Herbert Reed, whose influential book, Education Through Art, painted a bleak picture. The price we pay for this distortion of the adolescent mind is mounting up. A civilization of hideous objects and misshapen human beings, of sick minds and unhappy households, of divided societies and a world seized with destructive madness. The first edition of um, Reed's book was published um, before the end of the, the Second World War, um, but I think you can imagine that these words would have had particular import in the aftermath of that and the atom bomb. So Reed argued that the solution to this was to create more space for the arts in education. He believed that creative activities would not only heal the mind, but also unite man with nature and nation with nation. <coughs> Reed's understanding of the arts as a source of spiritual well-being was old. He was one in a long line of reformers who campaigned for the arts to be given a more central role in education. In the 1950s, such attempts to promote the arts acquired a new urgency, as certain governmental ministers began to suggest that scientific study might even take over the role that had traditionally been played by the, the arts, i.e. the role of furthering the development of human personality. When it came to musical culture, the situation was compounded by current aesthetic developments. A new generation of composers was emerging, headed by the so-called Manchester group, of which Maxwell Davis was a part. They drew inspiration from an international avant-garde that was witnessing a renewed interest in artistic abstraction in response to the war. Their formalist approach to composition resulted in aesthetically complex works that were welcomed by a handful of critics, but that tended to be much less popular with the general public. <coughs> As school teacher Alan Fluck noted, a large scale modern work will almost certainly be a guarantee of an empty hall, while even a small one slyly popped in will reduce attendances. The inaccessibility of such modern music was generally seen as a problem in Britain. As historian Michael Saylor has suggested, attitudes towards art had long been tempered by the country's particular Protestant ethos 
that prize moderation and utilitarianism. These values sat uncomfortably alongside those of the avant-garde, which instead pursued artistic autonomy and aesthetic experience as an end in itself. To make matters worse, there was a widespread belief that the Second World War had seen a rapid expansion in concert audiences. The emergence of the avant-garde now threatened to reverse this progress, reopening a chasm between the general public and elite culture. These developments thus raised a host of questions about the role of the arts in society. Was it irresponsible of the cultural elite to produce inaccessible art? Could the public learn to appreciate aesthetically complex works, or was trying to make them do so a lost cause? And who got to decide what counted as worthwhile art anyway? Maxwell Davis's appointment at Sirencester thrust him into the heart of this debate. <coughs> Sirencester was a state-funded grammar school with a liberal headmaster who valued the arts as part of a broad curriculum. And in keeping with the grammar school tradition, um, Simon Sester also sought to emulate some of the public school practices. Um, for example, they had Tuesday afternoons set aside for sports and extra recreational activities. Meanwhile, Maxwell Davis was at the forefront of the emerging avant-garde, writing music that even trained musicians struggled to appreciate. The composer quickly became aware of the tensions that this situation created. He reflected on the challenges in a handful of articles that were published in the early 1960s. Two anxieties in particular stand out. Um, they pervade not only Maxwell Davis's prose, but also criticism from this period more broadly. The first anxiety was that to write music that children could play, composers would have to dumb down their style. This uh, concern stemmed from the fact that the types of music played in secondary schools were not really considered worthy of serious composers. School repertory tended to consist of folk songs, simplified arrangements of classical symphonies, and purpose-written compositions in a classical idiom. Maxwell Davis was typical in considering such uh, arrangements available to school orchestra as stupid to the point of imbecility. However, his own compositional style could not be directly transplanted to the school context. Because to date, his music had been so difficult that even professional orchestras had struggled to play it. Commentators hoped that if what they called real composers started writing real music for schools, this would elevate educational music from its dubious status. But of course, the converse was also possible i.e. that the composer's image might be tarnished by their attempt to engage with this young audience. Another major concern was that the public might not listen to art music in the correct way. This concern derived from the notion that great art had a transcendental quality and that to experience music on this higher plane required close attention on the part of the listener. However, advances in sound reproduction technologies were seen to be discouraging proper listening. In part, this was because these technologies had made it possible to have a constant supply of music, and this was thought to encourage background listening. It was also because radio and gramophone quickly became associated with the popular music industry, and there was a growing narrative among intellectuals at this time that popular music had a mind-numbing effect on the general public. As Maxwell Davis explained, children are incapable of listening to others play, particularly if the sound comes out of a radio or gramophone with no visual aid to attention. This is only to be expected when they have background music most of the time, specially designed as such not to be listened to at all. In time, this may reduce people at an early age to complete insensitivity to the effects of music. The fact that these media, radio and gramophone, were also used to disseminate art music compounded anxieties. The cultural elite worried that the public would listen to art music in the same way that they listened to popular music, i.e. inattentively and passively. And the notion that all music might be listened to in the same way 
was uncomfortable because it threatened to blur the boundaries between elite and popular, which is to say it threatened to degrade art music by saddling it with the negative connotations of a mass medium. During the interwar period, educators had responded to this dilemma by trying to use these new technologies to teach correct listening. For example, they'd use music education broadcasts to disseminate a set of pedagogical tools that were designed to teach the public how to appreciate elite culture. The hope was that the public would thus learn to draw the same cultural distinctions as they did, and that this in turn would help to protect the status of elite culture. The belief that the public needed to be taught how to appreciate elite culture persisted into the post-war era. However, ideas about how to accomplish this were changing. Maxwell Davis was one of a growing body of educators who questioned the focus on listening skills. He went so far as to suggest that radio and gramophone had become so strongly associated with background listening that children couldn't listen to them any other way. His philosophy of education was based on the idea that performance should be used to teach music appreciation instead. He insisted that practical involvement in music making was necessary to counteract the complete insensitivity that was supposedly induced by excessive exposure to background music. Only when making music will children actually listen to it and learn to appreciate it. Making music well supposedly demanded a level of engagement that could not be achieved by listening alone. And this was especially true when it came to avant-garde music, since the difficult aesthetic and complex surface risked putting children off altogether. Of the 12 or so works that Maxwell Davis composed during his time at Sirencester, O Magnum Mysterium is the fullest outworking of this philosophy. As we will now see, it was designed to stage this learning process, taking pupils on a journey from performers to active appreciators. The work was conceived as a meditation on the wonder and promise of the nativity. It was made up of multiple movements. The instructions in the score about how to realise these were conflicting. Uh, the composer starts out by saying that the movements could be performed in any combination um, and in any order, depending on what resources a school had available. This flexibility was obviously designed to accommodate the different resources that different schools had, um, and certainly did serve to increase performances. However, um, treating the work in this way also jarred with the idea that a musical work should be a structurally integral and organic unit. So at the same time as Maxwell Davis encouraged uh, schools to be creative in how they use this um, collection of, of pieces, he also set out an ideal ordering. So I, in the ideal performance, the work would open with uh, the chant O Magnum Mysterium, which was uh, the material on which the whole of the rest of the piece was based. And ideally this would be sung three times, allowing the uh, SATB parts to be added incrementally. In addition, there were three further a cappella carols for SATB. Um, as the title suggests, these drew their sources from Latin and medieval English texts, um, and in both cases, the original language was retained. In between were two instrumental sonatas, um, which used a particularly wind and percussion heavy scoring. And finally, the work concluded with an organ fantasia on the opening theme. This eclectic combination of movements allowed the composer to draw on a variety of musical <coughs> idioms. And through this, he was able to cater to a range of different musical abilities. He considered this flexibility vital in the educational context, <coughs> since he did not want students to be either embarrassed by music beyond their technical capability, nor bored by the simplicity of their part. So at the beginner's end of the spectrum, the instrumental sonatas include six percussion parts that could, in theory, be realised by pupils with very prior, very prior musical training. Parts four and five, in particular, are almost entirely based on improvisation. 
They play in two passages in the second sonata. They don't play at all in the first sonata. Um, and during these passages, they have to create a simple and graphic representation of the spread and intensification of light of the nativity. The first passage might be realised like this. from the excerpt of the score here, um, the percussionists only have to play one simple notated rhythm, um, and after they've played this once, they then have to just go into free improvisation. In other words, these parts could potentially have been realised without knowledge of how to read a score. In between these improvisatory passages are sections that draw on what one critic described as a post webernish pointillism. Um, as anybody who's tried to play this sort of music will know, dovetailing such entries is really quite challenging. But despite this, the in individual instrumental parts are straightforward, at least in terms of the notes they play. These sonatas are interesting, then, because they feature the most idiomatically progressive writing in the piece, but they try to do so in a way that can accommodate the technical capacities of beginners. The carols demanded a slightly higher level of musical ability, which was in keeping with Siren Sester's long-running choral tradition. <coughs> These movements mix medievalism that evokes the respected British choral sound with post-tonal harmonies. When performed with the ideal ordering, the solo opening chant has a plain song-like simplicity. Besides the dramatic impact, including this solo performance also served a didactic end. As one of the conductors of an early performance explained, the chant was of haunting beauty, but it was also difficult to sing in tune. Given its awkward melody, it was best heard first as a soprano solo. The gradual addition of alto, tenor and bass parts also usefully rehearses the learning process providing an incremental introduction to the chromatic harmonies. So in the second rendition, we hear the alto being added. <laughs> 
then finally all four parts with also the tenor and bass. So the carols and the sonatas gave pupils the chance to learn the mechanics of modern music by performing it. However, in the composer's mind, the real purpose of these movements was to prepare the children for the final organ fantasia, which would take them to a deeper and more searching level. This was the point at which the entire meaning of the work was uh, intended to become apparent. As the composer explains, the music heard so far only really uh, becomes really comprehensible in relation to the concluding organ fantasia, to which it forms, as it were, a huge upbeat. This movement comprised a series of variations structured around six statements of an isorhythmic ground. It followed an arc-shaped trajectory that showcased the full range of the instrument. It begins with a quiet and slow statement of the chant in the bass. The music then gradually ascends in volume, tessitura and speed, and the melody is subjected to increasingly elaborate ornamentation before the process is rapidly reversed to end the piece. This is an excerpt from the centre of the movement. struggling with the volume there. Um, so this final number, as you can probably tell, made no concessions for amateur perfor performers. On the contrary, the composer wrote it with the organist of Manchester Cathedral, Alan Wicks, in mind. And for this uh, movement then, those on stage effectively became part of the audience as the organist undertook what one critic described as a feat of concentration and endurance on music's most complex and developed instrument. To be clear, though, the composer did not imagine this moment as a shift from active to passive participation on the part of the children, but rather he imagined that they would move from one type of active participation to another, from performing to actively listening. For actually listening, as, the, as Maxwell Davis put it, required the close attention and concentration comparable to that that was demanded of the performer. From our vantage point, the notion that avant-garde music might develop a mass appeal seems idealistic. And this idealism is clearly reproduced in O Magnum Mysterium, whose strategic planning has, I think, an eerily utopian quality. As we have seen, the composer conceived the work as an incremental in introduction to complexity. It stages the journey from performers to appreciators that educators hoped would secure avant-garde music an audience for the future. Just how idealistic this was is evident from some of the feedback from young performers. Um, often we don't have access to these sorts of 
uh, resources. But happily for the historian, um, somebody interviewed the young performers and published their responses in a music education journal in 1963. Um, and their account are in, accounts are interesting because they complicate the composer's narrative in some quite revealing ways. Their comments show that, for one thing, that the passages that were supposed to be the easiest to play ironically proved the most difficult. The oboist from an early London performance explained, the most interesting and unusual sections of the orchestral movements were the improvisation passages, which, when studied at first, seemed comparatively easy. When we came to play this piece, however, the straightforward passages fell into place quite easily. But in the easy parts, we had to adapt our methods of improvisation to fit in with the other player's interpretation. So although the improvisatory sections made comparatively few technical demands, the students clearly found them difficult to realise effectively. What is more, rather than providing the pinnacle of the experience, the fantasia seemed more often than not to have been the least popular part of the work. Students from Ealing Grammar School for Boys, which provided the tenors and basses for the first complete London performance, gave an array of negative feedback, which centred on the final movement. Reactions to the work tended to be rather gloomy, if impertinent. All found the organ conclusion most disappointing. Far too long and apparently unrelated. Not organ music. Distressing. Why so difficult? Silly. The consensus among these young performers, then, was that the music was too far removed from their normal experiences to be accessible, and a single performance was insufficient to resolve this. While the young performers showed no qualms about dismissing the work, the response of critics seems far more vexed. A few accused the composer of compromise. They claimed that such music would only maintain the rigid conservatism of school music. However, most of the commentators actually sought to salvage the work, and their reviews are interesting for the way that they simultaneously acknowledge and disavow the work's educational context. For example, one critic started by asserting that the piece was not at all that advanced. He then went on to argue <coughs> that it nevertheless surpassed its educational context, he wrote, O Magnum Mysterium can be experienced as a work of art, pure and simple. There was more than the quality of the music at stake here. The anxiety about the status of this piece points to an ideological struggle over the avant-garde's place in society. On the one hand, critics sought to position the work within the high art tradition, which in their minds was the mark of true value. On the other hand, they appealed to the educational backdrop to provide a sense of social awareness. And this helped to counterbalance the work's aesthetic inaccessibility, which sat so uncomfortably with British values. As one reviewer insisted, younger English composers relish the task of writing for schools. Here at last they can regain the feeling of having a function to fulfil. Here they can match their skill against living practical condition rather than flounder in the ideal non-conditions of a radio studio. Art is not created in a vacuum. In a country that had long been suspicious of artistic indulgence, appealing to utilitarian education agendas in this way served as a means of justifying the avant-garde's existence. It helped the music to seem socially relevant and its composers socially engaged. Looked at from this perspective, O Magnum Mysterium was not just an attempt to write serious educational music, it was also an attempt to write an avant-garde composition that took the problem of cultural accessibility seriously. The educational context was also invoked as this emerging generation of avant-garde composers sought to define their own voice against the broader European landscape. The grounds on which Britain was differentiated were often more rhetoric than reality, Numerous aspects of O Magnum Mysterium, in fact, had a precedent in wider European traditions of modernism. These included the recourse to music of the past as a way of breaking away from the present, the idea of listening as an active rather than a passive process, and the use of performance as a way into appreciating avant-garde music. But in post-war Britain, 
Critics and composers tried to reclaim these practices for their own as they sought to realise their visions of a modern society that was rooted at once in an idealised past and a utopian future. Looking beyond this post-war moment, the tensions that underpinned O Magnum Mysterium raise issues that I think relate to our understanding of Britain's elite musical culture more broadly. This historical snapshot captures a particular moment in longer histories of attempts to negotiate a middle ground between two apparently conflicting value systems. On the one hand, there was the pervasive reverence for the European high art tradition. On the other, there was this long-running commitment to broadening cultural access. The relationship between these two impetuses remained deeply fraught. And as I suggested at the start, scholars have struggled with the music written for educational purposes by the likes of Maxwell Davis because it sits uncomfortably between these two value systems. It seeks to retain its status as prestigious art music while also garnering a broad appeal. Its cultural status, in other words, is ambiguous. But it's precisely because of this that I think the repertoire provides such a rich lens onto Britain's cultural history. It usefully exposes the tension between these value systems, bringing to light the way they impacted on compositional aesthetics and underpinned critical discourse more broadly. Reanimating this cultural in-betweenness promises not only a more nuanced understanding of the musical past. Since we are the progeny of this musical establishment, it might also encourage a more critical and reflective engagement with some of the values that have persisted to this day. Thank you. his insights to this day so uh, that was really nice to hear so the themes of accessibility and learning through doing relevant for both our theme as kind of learning through doing gets uh, translated into this idea of research through performance through composition and through musical practice in general um, and relevant to the kind of and this idea of accessibility and this tension between these two value systems being so relevant to the kinds of debates that's happening in all of our universities as we try and find out what kind of <coughs> education we want for people and actually who is going to access that information, uh, that education and how. So really, thank you very much, Kate. So we have 10 minutes of questions. Relate to Britain, to Benjamin Britten, and you know, I'm thinking of noise flood in particular. You know, where you've got this, these kids' parts that are simple, and then you've got the professional street quartet. The other thing was, um, I was wondering if there's anything in the rhetoric around the foundation of the third program and the early growth of the third program that might <laughs> relate to some of the kind of some of the considerations that you have here. You know, you one would expect that things around the origins of that would speak to some of these. Um, thank you. So in terms of um, the Britain piece you mentioned, um, Noyes Flood is doing, in some sense, is doing exactly the same kinds of things in terms of trying to write music that, ch that was, uh, young children could perform and also bringing in adult composers. Um, and actually Vaughan Williams wrote a concerto for three orchestras that was designed to do exactly the same thing. So there are quite a few examples of this kind of thing um, from this time. <coughs> Um, one of the interesting things about the critical reaction to O Magnum Mysterium is that um, there was quite a big effort to distance it from the work that Britain had done. Um, one of the things that critics say is that um, things like Noyes Flood were conceived as entertainment, whereas this is somehow of a kind of higher art tradition. Um, and I think in that, you know, you really can see this attempt to, to negotiate a place for this piece that is... Um, on the kind of right side of this divide between high and low culture, and actually Britain's music becomes a, a way of doing that. Um, in terms of the third programme, um, 
yeah, I mean, I, uh, I guess that's interesting. I, to be honest, it's not a thing I've thought about a huge amount so far. I guess the diff one of the interesting things with the third program is that they, it's part of this move that has a very kind of stratifying effect on culture. Um, that you, there is this idea, you know, that people will progress from the the first program to the second and up to the third. Um, but at, whether that actually works or whether actually what it really serves to do is just kind of cordon off this very elitist product in a way that is quite undemocratic, um, I guess it's open for debate. Um, but certainly that, uh, in terms of the broader cultural moment, is very relevant to, the, uh, to yeah, what Maxwell Davis was doing. Thank you. It's really a question about how, how young Um, so, Siren Sester was a secondary grammar school, um, so uh, as far as I can work out, I guess the, the main evidence we have um, surviving is in photographs, and the children look like they're a fairly broad range of secondary school age children. Um, certainly there's an idea that the younger you can intervene, the more likely you are to influence people. Um, but my sense is that that's not really part of Maxwell Davis's rhetoric at this particular point. Obviously, this was the first time that he'd worked in a school context. Um, Warwick, you've jumped in. Do you want? Well, just on that subject, so my colleague uh, Stephen Arnold, who grew up in this area, sorry, this school, the Maxwell School, said that the And I guess there's a research. Um, and it would be, in, yeah, it would be interesting um, in, if you did that to find out what, to what extent these, this experience has in fact impacted um, the way that they've continued to relate um, to this music and to adulthood. Um, yeah, I have thought about that. It's not something I've quite ventured into doing yet, but thank you. You, you position uh, um, Britain as in the, the nation. Um, as against Europe in the way that, that we were capable of dealing with avant-garde composers. But where would you go if you actually turned to pop music at that time? Because you started with the Beatles, which you know arguably is quite inaccessible pop music, which was embraced, you know, Britain led the way in, in, in pop music, and, and the Beatles were embraced in a way that actually inaccessible pop music wouldn't, it isn't today. Uh, in such a mass way. I, it's not really a question. I, I, I in what sense you do, you think the, do you think the Beatles' early stuff is inaccessible? In that it's experimental. That's interesting. I don't know that I in in aesthetic terms, that I necessarily agree with that. I think the Beatles, I mean, the later stuff, certainly, but the early stuff... Um, uh, yeah, anyway, um, that's an aside. Um, so I guess, uh, what do I think? I, th I, I think that the dichotomy between Britain and the continent, just to intervene on that front, is a rhetorical one. I think there are lots of ways in which you can... that di Those distinctions aren't actually borne out in kind of real life. Um, I guess what I'm interested in is the way that that rhetorical distinction has, was used at the time and has <coughs> continued to make, it, make itself felt within scholarship. Um, in terms of the Beatles and yeah, I don't know what I think about that. Thank you. I'll, yeah, I'll think about it a bit more. I suppose it was just an interesting set of set of layered um, hierarchies. Sure. I yeah. I, I, well, I guess I mean the whole narrative about popular music being simplistic is very much an elitist one, anyway, isn't it? Um, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
knew a lot of composition students would turn up and the musicologist would moan, well, it's music again. <laughs> Um, so uh, I guess the first thing to say, you're absolutely right. I guess this comes back to the layers thing. It's not just layers within popular music, but also layers within um, elite musical culture. Um, one of the interesting things I think about this particular 19, late 1950s, early 1960s moment is that there seems, so there seems to be a sense that in the first part of the century, a lot of work's been done teaching the public how to appreciate the classics, Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn. Now we've done that work, we can start to move on to this other stuff, which is also seen as being more relevant for the day. Um, so yeah, it's useful to, I guess within this one case study, those distinctions aren't teased out, but they're very much there. Um, in terms of whether people ought to listen to, um, we ought to encourage people to listen to this sort of ghettoized avant-garde music. Um, <coughs> this is probably an evasive answer. I guess I'm interested in the historical debates about it. So I'm. I think the point is a really is a really important one in that there's a serious question about actually how <coughs> democratic these kinds of initiatives really were. They were certainly claiming to be democratic in that you get this whole kind of paternalistic benevolence, you know, we have this, this thing that we think is a very precious thing and we want to share it with you because even though you, you like your popular music, actually, you know, you haven't realised it's really rubbish and you really ought to be listening to this other good stuff. And there is, I guess it's one of those things where there's a tension, right? On the one hand, that's profoundly undemocratic. On the other hand, I think a lot of the people um, who were involved in these kind of initiatives really did believe that they were doing a good thing. Um, I guess whether you think they were or not personally is kind of up to you. One more quick word. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, so, I suppose I, I'm, I'm interested in um, you know, other, other ways you might develop the, the project theoretically or the ideas you have about it theoretically. I, I like this, this idea that the music might act as a, as a lens um, to some of the this sort of stratification or some of these binary oppositions that you've got in play. Um, I, I suppose I'd sort of, it struck me, just in the way you present it, I mean, it's, I think it's a really interesting project, but is there a sense in which the, you kind of establish those binary oppositions before you, before you think about how this lens might work, or how it might cast new light on those oppositions? So that, that was, the, do you get the idea of that? And, the, and then, I mean, I, I'm with you to a certain extent, because I think, you know, this stratification is a social reality, but on that point, you know, is, is the fact that it's a grammar school something that you need to uh, pursue further and, and unpack? Um, so if I can start with the second question first. Um, I think the fact that it is a grammar school is massively significant. Um, and I guess this comes back to this question of democracy as well. Like even when these initiatives are taking place, who are they aimed at? Um, I guess within the broader context of the book, um, one of the things that will hopefully counterbalance that is some work on um, the film that the Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra was written for, um, and that was actually commissioned for secondary modern schools, so it was targeting a much broader, um, in theory, was targeting a much broader demographic. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, clearly the grammar school context is um, already a very elitist one, and actually, I, I didn't say this earlier, but um, Siren Sester at this time was, so it was state-funded, but it was selective, um, and took the sort of top 25% of people from the area um, in terms of you know, ability, their, their educational um, abilities, academic abilities. Um, so yeah, clearly that's already an elitist establishment. Um, in terms of how, of the, how I deal with these binaries, um, I guess in, yeah, in, the, in the book project, um, what I'm envisaging is that the, the in a sort of introductory section, we'll trace some of the history of these. I think they really date back to the 19th, you know, late 19th century, and but particularly come into force in the interwar period when um, 
I think particularly because of the rise of mass culture technology and radio, uh, technologies like gramophone and radio, you, there's a sense in which um, these distinctions are being drawn in much more polarised terms than they've ever been before. Um, I guess I'm... Uh, yeah, I don't, and I guess the difficult thing is how do you talk about these without reinforcing them? Um, my aim is not, is not to say, oh yes, actually, elite music is much better than popular music, but I guess more to try and understand some of where these ideas have come from um, and how that's been affected or produced by these particular um, historical moments. Um, I don't know whether that answers the first part of your question. Yeah, yeah, no, it's just whether, the, and I suppose also whether the music, you know, you talked about it acting as a lens, but I'm not sure at the moment what it what it brings to these questions around these binary oppositions, other than to say, well, it's kind of negotiating a space somehow between them. But, I mean, maybe that's enough to say. Um, I guess that the... I guess I'm interested in the, in the way that the ideologies are borne out in aesthetic terms. Um, and I think that that's why talking about the kind of pieces of music is important because, I mean, hopefully I've shown with this piece that there are some quite clear ways in which the ideologies that um, Maxwell Davis had around education affected the type of music he was writing and that then that raises a whole load of interesting questions for critics about how, like, how do you deal with a piece of music that is trying to be high art music but also trying to appeal to a broad audience when those two things have historically seemed to be in conflict. Um, so I do think, yeah, I mean, I think the, the actual kind of aesthetics of the music, what it ends up sounding like, is really relevant. Okay, so thank you very much again.